If I haven't met you, one of the pastors here, I serve as a chaplain with the fire department, uh, fire rescue, my name's Mickey Stonier, and I want to introduce you to our fire chief, Javier Maynard. Thank you very much, thank you. And uh, <clears throat> I think you're loved here. And also a member of the Rock Church, but our, uh, Harbor, Be our Harbor Police Chief, John Bolduck, also here with us. Uh, Good to be here, thank you. Wow. Go ahead and have a seat. <clears throat> well, thank you so much. Uh, these incredible men representing some incredible uh, personnel that serve our city on a daily basis. And, and I know this week, just watching on television and all the uh, reflections these past over this past decade, I know it could be very emotional, but just what are your thoughts, your reflections bringing you to today? Where were you on September 11th, 10 years ago? Well, you know, I was uh, serving as a fire investigator. I was in the office uh, watching this on TV. My counterpart, a sergeant in the police department, had grown up in New Jersey, had just been back to the Twin Towers about two weeks before, and, you know, I was just in, in, in shock that the uh, towers had come down. Uh, because all firefighters have been trained to that point that that simply would not happen. The, the building would burn up and we'd go back and rehab the skeleton, but uh, just an, an incredible, incredible tragedy. Mm. I was serving as a police chief in a small town in Minnesota, Brainerd, Minnesota. Shout out to you Vikings fans. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> now talk about disasters, so yeah. we better uh, <laughs> pray for uh, chief. Yeah, I have a friend named Adrian Peterson uh, on, the twin, on the Vikings, so we'll see what he does today. Yeah. Um, I think that bankrupt your city, though, so that's kind of... <laughs> um, my thoughts immediately uh, when I saw the disaster unfolding on the television was uh, that of a friend who worked for the Port Authority Police Department uh, in New York, New Jersey, uh, a friend who I'd become acquainted with while I was training uh, at the FBI Academy, and I uh, hadn't heard from him for five mm -hmm. days. And after the fifth day, I got an email uh, explaining that he was... He was safe, uh, that they had lost over 40 members of their police wow, department, wow. including men and women from every rank, including their chief, their superintendent, captains, lieutenants, sergeants, rookies. Uh, it, it spared no one. Mm. Now, how are departments different as a result of the Twin Towers? Uh, you know, I would just share, uh, it has brought law enforcement and uh, the fire service agencies together. Uh, John and I are both wearing uh, a commemorative badge that talks about that unity. You know, before there was some good-natured uh, kidding between the two different professions, and I, I think what it has done is, is it really cemented the relationships and that we do need one another and serve you far better when we work together. Another uh, positive that came out of it was the uh, collaboration between state, federal, local, uh, across jurisdictions, police, fire, medical service. Uh, you saw silos of uh, emergency services all across the country in the past. But after this event, uh, everybody realized that they had to put aside their, uh, their egos, mm -hmm. their loyalties to their individual profession or agency, and it was about executing the mission, which requires us to work together, share information, You've seen joint terrorism task forces uh, evolve all over the country, uh, gathering data, working to uh, interrupt and prevent attacks, and then in the event of emergencies, working better together across jurisdictions. And so that's mm -hmm. been a positive for our country. Well, uh, San Diego Gas and Electric this week kind of uh, did a nice exercise to prepare us for today. Uh, uh, what? Uh, what, do, what would you encourage us as family members? I would imagine many of us were unprepared even for lack of power. Uh, how can we be better prepared as families, uh, individuals? Well, you know, this is the Do Something Church. All of you are, so I suspect. Amen. Yeah, excellent. You guys have done some great work in our community. I, I will share a lesson that John and I know well, that to be able to serve others, you first have to ensure that you're okay in a position to do that. So my encouragement to you is to take seriously uh, developing a disaster plan for your family and self-sufficiency for up to 72 hours. Uh, how many were a little hungry when they couldn't get to their favorite fast food restaurant? Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
So t take care of yourselves first so that you can serve others after that. Go ahead. In a word, have a plan. Uh, the time to formulate a plan isn't when the disaster hits. Uh, that's when we're more susceptible to panic and perhaps making decisions that may not be uh, helpful in the long run for ourselves, our families, and our community. So have a plan ahead of time. Think about it. Uh, where we're, what is the rally point? Just like having a, a fire evacuation plan for your home. Where will you meet? Uh, what, what is the plan when you don't have cell phone communication like back when we started? Uh, you know, what happens, you know, oh my goodness, the cell phone is dead. I can't call mom and find out what I'm supposed to do. Uh, but have plans for communications, for food, for water, for shelter. There, there's a number of things that you can do to be prepared. You know, if I could add one more thing, there are plenty of opportunities. Uh, certainly the church has shown that it's willing to help the community in a very big way. But there are opportunities through CERT programs or volunteers active in disaster that you can become involved in to really lend your time and talent in the aftermath uh, of a disaster of any nature. Uh, there simply aren't enough first responders to go around and we really come together as a community to help one another. Um, Chief Maynard said that we're a do something church and I <clears throat> want to encourage you in the bulletin there's a side panel there that you can fill out and we're going to be launching here at the Rock Church in service to our community uh, the Rock uh, disaster response teams. In fact in a couple weeks we're going to be having some orientations to explain all the opportunities to engage within the fire department. They have the CERT program that you can be trained for your immediate neighborhood. Uh, for preparedness and what to do to help your neighbors. Uh, also with the police departments, the crisis uh, intervention teams, as well as the Rock Church, we're going to be having some disaster response teams. So uh, fill that out, drop it off at the information center. Also we'll be in touch with you, but make note those dates are in your bulletin. We're going to do some orientations explaining how to get connected because uh, in service to our community we have some open doors with the Office of Emergency Services. Uh, to be equipped to serve as a church. And the Rock Church, our facility, the building, uh, we're looking at being used as a spontaneous volunteer center for the county. That people will be directed to come here to learn about how they can serve in the community during a large scale disaster. But it, it definitely helps if you have a plan for your family in advance. So I want to thank you both for being here uh, and representing your departments and thank you so much for your service to us and our community. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you all. All right. Thank you. Good. good. Well this I'm going to have you all stand up. <clears throat> Real simple question. Where were you 10 years ago, September 11th, in the morning of that day? And I can even ask you, what was the weather like that day? Go ahead, turn with someone standing next to you. Do you have a memory of that day? Those of you joining us online, uh, also I want to encourage you to reflect on where you were that day on September 11th, that faithful day. <clears throat> you can go ahead and be seated. Maybe some of you were eight or nine years old. Maybe you have memories really as a child. This week uh, I actually posted on, on my Facebook, you know, how have things changed over the last 10 years for the good or for the worse? It's interesting some of the stories that people responded. Tyler said, 9-11 is one of the main reasons I enlisted in the military. Irreplaceable experiences that forever changed my life for the better. Even now, I'm, uh, now that I'm no longer serving. And Sam, he said, after 10 years, it's about time that we move on from 9-11, he said. Besides, there are more pressing needs to take care of in the present and future challenges to prepare for. 
Lori said, we have one less seat at our dinner table as her son was killed over in, uh, as a serving over in uh, Afghanistan. You know, our, our lives definitely have changed, conveniences, things have changed. Ten years ago, I was in Ontario at a meeting with the police department up there, and I have a, cell, a pager back then that was to notify me. I'm, I'm on a special response team for disasters, airline disasters. One month out of the year, I'm to be on call when there is a major incident that would occur. Back in 2001, my month happened to be September. Led me back to New York for the first two weeks of, of uh, the Twin Towers serving at at Ground Zero, serving at the Family Assistance Center, and then we had a team over at the temporary morgue. We, it's interesting, we were called the Spiritual Care Aviation Incident Response Team, which an acronym or the acrostic would spell out the word scare. So we were the scare team. You know, here comes the, the, the chaplains providing assistance for people. We're, we're the scare team. Uh, of course, that was changed to the critical response team eventually, but spending the first couple of weeks there, and I know we have all have our reflections, our memories of that day. For me, you know, just the, the, just the overwhelming emotion uh, there at Ground Zero and serving the firefighters, police officers, and those that were there doing, having the, the response responsibilities, the rescue efforts, uh, the, just the anguish of heart. But it was amazing there in New York how polite people were, how things had changed. Things had slowed down, uh, the relationships, people coming together. But then it seemed like how quickly things reverted back to normal. Now, it's important in recovery that we get back into the normalcy of things, but I, I don't know about you, but the last decade, with tsunamis and earthquakes and the fires we've had here and uh, just the floods and hurricanes. And it's just like bam, 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 one, one after another as, as things continue to intensify for us, excuse me, intensify for us as a, a nation, kind of those wake-up calls for us. And yet I realize not, each and every one of us have 9-11 events in, in our lives. Maybe you weren't there at the Twin Towers. You weren't there at a, a major uh, a disaster that rocked a whole nation. But just as significant, some of us have lost loved ones, lost job, health issues, dealing with aging uh, parents, Alzheimer's, all of these really can really take us to the very foundation of who we are and what we believe. And, so this morning, we want to look at when foundations fall, and I, I want to turn to Psalm 11 there in your study guide, it's there, kind of guiding us through. And in the fire department, we, we have what, what are called the four F's. And for us here today on your study guide, we'll deal with the, the three F's, which is faith, family, and friends. You see, when you reduce life down to its bare essentials, you, you really come down to the core issues of relationship with God, with each other. Of course, in the fire department, we understand, fire rescue department, that faith, family, friends, if, if people, the, the personnel have those foundations in place, the fire department will, will have healthy workers to serve our community. Of course, now of late, we have a fifth F, which is funding, uh, no money, so... <laughs> You know, working with uh, the situations that we're, we're dealing with. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of serving with one of our fire chiefs, battalion chief, and he had failing health, and all of a sudden he, he had died suddenly. Of course, I'm at the hospital there with the family. The next day, I connected with the family at their home, and one point, just the extended family there, the emotion that, that's there in the room, this beloved individual as he had, had passed away, he was a believer in Jesus Christ, and as we're sitting around the table and the family was reflecting on their dad, their husband, all of a sudden, just all the emotion as we're talking about the memorial service and the youngest daughter at the time was, was daddy's girl, and with all the emotion that was there, she's a senior in high school, she just cries out and says, 
Who's going to be there to walk me down the aisle? Who's going to be there to, when I graduate? Who's going to be there for the, the birth of my first child? And at that moment, everyone just in the room, just quiet as all this emotion and very normal, the anguish of this young girl, daddy's girl, as her daddy is gone. And the very questions that she's asking, very real. And at that moment, I, I felt just quiet in my heart. How do you answer that question? Why, why, why? And after a moment, I kind of bowed my head and then the mother turns to me and says, you're the chaplain, say something, you know. <laughs> I guess silence wasn't golden at that moment. And I just pray, I said, Lord, what, what do you say? And then at that moment, I just said, what would your daddy say to you right now? And at that moment, she said, that's unfair. I go, what would your daddy say to you right now? She said, God is still on the throne. It comes here from Psalm 11. You see, her daddy had taught her the foundations of life. When your world is shaken, God is still on the throne. Look with me here, Psalm 11. Says, in the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, uh, flee as a bird to your mountain? You see, many of us, when Trials come our way. We, we just want to run, as in Psalm 55 or 6 says, I wish I was like a bird, a, a dove, I could fly away from here. Um, and then he goes on, the psalmist David says, For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Some of us, very much so, have had foundations that have been shaken in life. The very core where you, you say, why? Why is this happening? What am I to do? When I was at, at uh, the Family Assistance Center, met a man who uh, worked in the Twin Towers above the 90th floor. Now, how can that be? He worked in the Trade Center above the 90th floor where the, the plane came in, and he shared his story with me. He, he says, you know... I lost my job September 10th. I unjustly was fired. I was so upset, crying out, God, what are you doing? Why would you allow this to happen? And now on September 10th, September 11th, looking back, he realized his life was spared. You know, the times in our life where the foundations are shaken, what are you going to do? What do you do? You know, the lights went out in San Diego. All the power went out and caused great chaos for a moment. And I posted, again, just an encouragement to those, you know, we need to get prepared for times of disaster. In your study guide, we have the link for you to have a family disaster plan, family and friend disaster plan. Uh, you just click in that, that site and up comes a PDF. I encourage you to print it out. Now, you would have that, but I posted a little comment, you know, or another disaster here in San Diego, and a, a chaplain friend who's in Afghanistan or Iraq right now, he said, wow, the power went out in San Diego, and your chilled juice isn't cold, <laughs> <laughs> and that's a disaster. It says, perspective is everything, isn't it? Perspective is everything. Well, the, the psalmist, he, he's asking the question, what, why? And our, our pastor did a whole series on why bad things happen. If you weren't here, I encourage you to go on our webpage and did just, just a phenomenal job walking through perspectives of what happens when the world falls apart. The why questions we ask. Well, David came to this conclusion. He said, if the foundations are destroyed what can the righteous do? Verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. God is on the throne. Now turn with me to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. You know, I, sometimes we have these, we're, we're, we grow up as little children. And we have our kind of the, the fairy tale perspectives, Disneyland up in Anaheim where I was born, Mickey, you know, uh, my, my household 
extended family there. And my, my gran- I have a granddaughter when she was probably about three years old, little Kennedy, and I was at Target with my wife, and I saw these glitterly, uh, glitter little shoes that reminded me of Cinderella, and I thought, oh, I got to get these for Kennedy. We were reading Cinderella to her, and so I got the shoes and went to my daughter's house, and, and so she had just woken up from a nap, and so here comes Bapa, that's what she calls me, Bapa with the Cinderella shoes, and we had been reading the story, and so I'm walking upstairs, and I say, Cinderella, Cinderella, your prince is here looking for Cinderella. And so I'm walking upstairs and I had the shoes in my hand and I walked in her room, she's sitting up on her bed, her eyes just bright as can be. And she's got this big grin as big as can be on her face. And I said, I I found these special slippers and I need to see if they fit that you're the princess, you know? And so I got down on one knee, and again, she's just overwhelmed with emotion, and I kind of get on one, one on her foot, so one's there, they're a bit tight. And then so I get to the second shoe, and I'm down on my knee, and I go, Cinderella, is this you? Are you my princess? And the shoe wouldn't fit, and I'm shoving it. And then she starts crying, she goes, I'm not Cinderella! <laughs> I was like, oh. That's like Bapa coming slapping my little, little granddaughter. Nope, you're not. Ha ha ha, fooled you. <laughs> Went back to the store, got some size double E, you know, the little <laughs> boats that tried it again second round. Wasn't quite as exciting, you know. But we don't live in a fairy tale, do we? We don't live in a fairy tale. You see, much of Scripture, much of the Bible is dealing with this question. You have in your study guide a number of Scriptures there, Habakkuk or Habakkuk, in chapter 1, where he says, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you not hear, even cry out to you violence and you not save? Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? Here's the prophet, he's saying there's so much evil in the world. Why are you allowing this? And God says to the prophet, he says, well, I'm going to actually bring a more wicked nation than you to your nation that's going to bring judgment upon this nation. And so he's like, what is going on? And then God says to him, the just shall live by faith. We must live by faith that God knows. In fact, later in chapter 2, verse 20, he says once again, for I am on the throne. God is on the throne. Jeremiah the prophet in chapter 12 in your study guide, righteous are you, O Lord. I plead with you, yet let me talk to you about your judgments. Why does the wicked prosper? Here he says, here's the prophet. Lord, I know you're good, but can I talk to you a little bit about your fairness, your justice? I'm gonna put a little phrase on the screen. doesn't have any gaps between the the letters. I want you to look up on the screen this phrase and tell me what is it that you read? Um, Actually, a few couple words there. What is it that you read? God is what? Well, you can read it two ways. God is now here or God is nowhere. And it's times like this when the foundations are are falling in our lives, we get to the very core of what we believe, a core of relationships of where we are. And some people come to the conclusion, where is God in all of this? God is nowhere in this. Where others come to that final place of brokenness, God is now here. When we say why, do you realize in Matthew, there in your study guide 27, Jesus himself, he asked why. He said, my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? It's okay to ask why. It's okay to to question. It's okay to let our anguish out in those times, those moments where we're just, the world is just unsettled. We don't know where we're going, what's going on when the foundations are falling. Well, here in Psalm 73, It's a a psalm of Asaph, who was one of the musicians of David that writes a number of these beautiful psalms. 
Verse one, he says, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. He says, you know, I know God's good, but I live in a world where things seem unfair. How come sometimes the most horrible people seem to prosper and some of the most beautiful and generous and gracious and good people sometimes suffer? Where is God in all of this? And he starts to question, why? Why is it that things seem random? In fact, we have a book of the Bible, Job, or if you're out of work, Job, uh, the book of the Bible that's dealing with this whole question of why, why life seems so unrandom, uh, random at times, and very end of the book of Job, God answers the question. He doesn't explain himself. He just says, I'm on the throne. I am God. And here in, in Psalm 73, as you skip ahead in verse 16, he says, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their end. See, there is this perspective, this place, this place of brokenness. Now, I, I wanna draw attention to the study guide there. There's a, a couple of, there's a scripture in Psalm 34, verse 17, that says, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Actually, Psalm 51, 17, if you're taking notes, says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You know, life, sometimes we, we, we can be so busy about so many things. Recently, here coming to the Rock, which is a busy, busy place, and now I, I was just intentionally trying to j just hear people's hearts and asking people, "How are you doing?" And it was like nine out of ten people said, "Busy, busy, busy." And I thought about that, and it's okay to be busy about the things of God, but sometimes we can be so busy that we we don't have time to reflect on who we are and where we're going and the relationships of our faith, our family, our, our friendships. In fact, C.S. Lewis in his uh, book, he, he has a book called Screwtape Letters and it's an interaction, of course fiction, between a, a demon with his underlings and one of the questions they're wrestling with was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's writing to Screwtape this young demon and he's challenging them that you know we can't go against the fact of the resurrection many people are believing and I quote he says there's one thing we can do we must double our efforts we must do everything we can to make sure that these humans do not believe in Jesus and if they do they, we must make them lukewarm or too busy with other things to be of any use to him you know, it's those, those moments when the foundations are destroyed, or I, I don't know about you, but when the power went off in San Diego, eventually I made my way home, and our family gathered, we had candlelight, and we just hung out, and we talked. And we just sat around, shared and reflected, no media, no electricity, and I realized, wow, I know this is a bad thing, but yet it was doing a good thing in our families. Things slowed down to where we connected with relationships. Uh, a time where we could reflect one with another. Well, the same thing in our faith. Here in, in Psalm 73, where again in verse 17, he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Let me encourage you, let me challenge you as as we reflect on 9-11 10 years ago, but yet our own 9-11s, and then looking forward to that which is ahead. When the foundations are being shaken, what do the righteous do? This psalmist says it was coming to that place of 
sanctuary, a place of slowing down, a quiet place of reflection. And I'm gonna leave you with three things to do in time of disaster when your world is falling apart or when trials and tribulations come your way that you come into the sanctuary, you come into that place of stillness, that slowing down perspective, and there on the second page of your study guide you have the uh, three W's, which I think really give us a faith disaster plan. We have our family, our friends, but then at the very core of our faith because we see these scriptures that are outlined for us and responses when you enter into that place of sanctuary that quiet place where you get perspective. It's been said that our uplook should determine our outlook about, on our circumstances. Well, there in Job chapter one, it's Job had lost everything and Job arose, tore his clothes and shaved his head and fell to the ground and he worshiped. You know, Giuliani, when he was interviewed about 9-11 10 years ago, he says, you know, it was so important that we kept our calm got our perspective, slowed down, think things through. And I think of here in Job, the first W, and that perspective of worship, when we, things are shaken in our life, rather than questioning, where are you, God? God's right there in the midst. His promises are sure. And that he gives us privilege in a time when our world is shaken to actually ponder, enter the sanctuary of God and worship. Secondly, I would challenge us as the, uh, Isaiah says, wait on the Lord. The second W, to have that stillness, that place where wait on the Lord, you'll renew your strength, mount up with wings as eagles, you shall run and not be weary, walk and not faint. Or as it, it says in, in the Psalm uh, 37, to delight in the Lord as you wait on the Lord. Our president this morning read out of Psalm 46 and you got to verse 10 where it says, be still and know that I am God. Now, I don't know your life situation right now, the trials, the frustrations. Maybe you're like Sam, yeah, it's time to get over 9-11. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that perspective, but it is important that we, we're looking towards the future. And maybe you have a 9-11 going on in your your, your life right now, and there's turmoil going on with relationships, broken relationships, situations at work, family, illness, just the overwhelming sense, and you question, God, why? Why? Are you, where are you in all of this? My foundations are being destroyed. I encourage you to slow down. Let God's still, small voice speak to you as you wait for him to reveal himself in the sanctuary. And then finally, Second Timothy encourages us as all scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's where we get perspective from God's word, the word of God. See, it's worship, it's waiting, and then going to the word of God. Uh, turn back to Psalm 73 as we pick up there, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood there, and verse 21 says, thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. There are those times, uh, I remember there was a fire in Kearney Mesa, and my fire department, fire rescue department, the pager went off, there were two fatalities, and as a chaplain, I'll, I'll go to those events, I, I went, battalion chief was there, I said, are there any family members you want me to connect with, and there was a woman standing off, very, just emotional as we would imagine, he says, well, on the lawn there, under the tarp, is this, this precious woman, it's her mother and her sister that were lost in the fire. I walked up to her, I introduced myself, I said, ma'am, I am so sorry, um, I'm here to assist you. My name's Mickey. I'm one of the chaplains here at the, in the, in the fire rescue department. She grabbed me in both shoulders and just squeezed with all the emotion. And she said, why would God allow this to happen to me? You know, in those moments, 
You know, I'm not gonna give her the 12 classical responses uh, or give the sermon on why bad things happen. Uh, I could go through and explain the theology and the perspectives of things. That's not what she was saying. She was saying, I am hurting so much. My life has just been torn out from under me and I don't know what to do. And at that moment, she didn't need an explanation. She just needed someone to be there. I got in touch with families. We got food brought in and just being there, walking through this process. And by the end of the day, later that day, just being with her, it was relationships were built and the comforts were there. And then she asked again, why would God allow this to happen? I said, you know what? I don't have that answer for you, but I know this, God sent me here to bring his love and his support to you. And, and we're here to serve you in this community. And that's what the church is to be. I, I don't have all those answers. Many people turn, I was in the, uh, getting, picking up a prescription this past week and I walked down the pain aisle. I couldn't believe, you know, when you really think about it, there's ibuprofen, there's aspirin, et cetera, and there's Motrin, there's all these, you know, pain relievers that we have to cover our pain, plus the, all the uh, various prescription pain relievers that, that we have to help cover our pain, but many turn to alcohol. I had a, uh, actually, this is a true story. I have a, a chaplain friend, his name's Charlie. Charlie the chaplain, yeah, that works out real good. And he was up in Montana, and he was doing a ride-along, and they pull, pulled over a drunk driver, a guy was swerving in the road, and as they were interviewing, he was, happened to be with the girlfriend, and the police officer was giving a sobriety test to this guy. And as they're walking through everything, uh, the chaplain and the officer get together, they're gonna need to transport him, and he said, this guy's drunk. And Charlie, he says, you know, uh, his fiance's here was sharing that this guy's real hard-headed, he wouldn't let her drive, you know, he, it wouldn't propose to her. I mean, he wouldn't set a date for the wedding. He's just real stubborn, good luck with him and all of that. And so they conversed together and came up with this little plan. So the officer went to him. He's leaning up against the car and kind of swaying. He goes, well, you know, I'm talking to the chaplain and I understand you're engaged to this woman, but you're having a hard time making a commitment to actually get married. He goes, I have a deal for you. Since the chaplain's here, I'm gonna allow him to go ahead and perform a wedding ceremony and if you'll agree to this, we'll go ahead and drive you home for your honeymoon and I won't take you to jail. But if you don't allow us to do this, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to transport you to jail and you're gonna be there for a while. <laughs> True story. And the guy's leaning back against his car like this and he says, how long will I go to jail? <laughs> <laughs> Not a good response. Uh, things didn't go well from there. We masked ourselves with so many things, sometimes to cover the pain, to hide, to, to deal, rather than confronting here. And listen as we close with this verse. It says, these verses, verse 22, I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you, God says. You hold, you hold me by my right hand, God. God holds us by his right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you and there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but these two words, but God. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. But God, when the foundations are being destroyed, when foundations fall, what are we to do but God? but God is still on the throne. Now I wanna invite you, no matter what your circumstances, before we rush out to the busyness of the world, and it's okay to be busy, but just to stop right now. All of the reflections and all that's going on in your life, you and God right now, 
For some of you, I know God has a divine appointment for you. He's been knocking on the door of your heart through circumstances, through relationship. He's, he's been, your world has been allowed to be shaken to get you to a place where you'll start to deal with the issues of faith, family, friends, your relationships. And the circumstances, the why questions, God, what, what are you doing? And yet God wants to bring you to this sanctuary, this place of worship, a place of communing with God, friendship with God, a place where you can wait and chill and let God be God in your life, and then allowing you to open up the pages of Scripture that his word would bring refreshment to your heart. For some of you, perhaps at once in your life, you, you, you started getting close to God, but you've drifted so far and your brain and heart has been swirling about, not really having a foundation, a perspective. It's like the carpet pulled out from under you. My question to you is, the foundations are being shaken. As in the book of Amos, it was storm after storm, famine, one thing after another for decades, one thing after another. The people would get scared for a moment and then go right back to where they were. And God kept saying to them, he said, uh, you know, return to me, return to me, return to me. And finally he says, prepare to meet your God. As time and time again the warnings came, the shakings came, but because of hardness of heart, people didn't, didn't surrender to the Lord. Maybe you're at a place where you've drifted from the Lord. I know according to the scriptures that, but God, but God, we're just a prayer away. As we close this service, I, I want to encourage you this, this morning to pray that your relationship with God would be mended, your relationship by faith. The Bible says that God so loved you that he gave his one and only son who was on a cross saying, my God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? He experienced that for you, for me that all the past, all the worries, all the frustration, all the brokenness can be put aside, that we can be made right with God. We can become friends once again. When the foundations are destroyed, what will the righteous do? God is on the throne. Is he on the throne of your heart? Let's bow our hearts together. Lord, I, th I just thank you for the beautiful people that sit before me this day. I know this week has been a week of reflection, and as a nation, as a people, as a city, we have those reminders that quicken us, giving us perspective, we're unprepared. And I know there's people sitting right here today and those watching online, and those in the North County right now that are watching this service, one with us in the spirit, and I, of the challenges of who we are as a people. And yet there's some that are sitting here right now that their faith, their foundation is not really settled yet on you. And if that's you this, this uh, day, I, I want to ask you, would you call upon the Lord? Would you ask him to be the God of your life, to be the foundation of your life? And as uh, the music's getting played, I'm gonna ask you to, to take a stand for Jesus Christ. As grace has been shed for you, if you're at a place that you realize you need God in your life, I'm gonna ask you to stand right where you are and say, Jesus, I, I realize that I'm not where I need to be. I know the foundations have been shaken in my life. I wanna take a stand for you as you took a stand for me on the cross. If that's you, would you stand right where you are? Make a public declaration that you wanna surrender your life to Christ. The song of grace that is here. God bless you. God bless you. Maybe you've walked with the Lord in the past and you realize that you're not where you need to be. I want to encourage you. 
encourage you to make those things settled, that you would be in the sanctuary of God. Lord, you see us as a people. You see us as a nation. I would pray that in the, just the beauty of your grace, that we would enter that sanctuary. I'm going to ask you all to stand with me. All stand together. And I want you to pause as you reflect upon this song. It's amazing grace. The grace that God has for us. And if you would, wouldn't mind just closing your eyes and reflecting for a moment. Lord, we, we know we need your grace. And I thank you once again for the encouragements that you give us in, in times of loss and brokenness, times of pain, times of suffering, that your grace is sufficient for each and every one of us. And I pray as we go from here today, and I pray that we would be of those people that are mindful of your sanctuary and the power of your work of love in and through each and every one of us, but God will strengthen our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.